Hello everyone. Um, today I sort of want to um, tickle your brains a little bit about like you know, the whole idea behind cryptocurrency. Um, in the traditional finance world, people have been asking like, why does this asset class go up so crazily and why does it drop so crazily as well? Like if you've not sort of like paid attention, um, in the last couple of days, um, Bitcoin has lost about $2,000 in value just from one news. And the news is that um, the SEC was going to look at approving um, an exchange traded fund. Now that didn't go through. The SEC delayed the decision and the price of Bitcoin just tanked. So if you held Bitcoin like last week, you would be in pain today because you would have lost something like 30% or 40% of the, the value of your coins. Um, if you were holding Altcoins like Litecoin and other different cryptocurrency would have lost an even larger percentage overall. So when we start looking at something like this and we say that, you know, like what's its actual fundamental value? You know, like in gold, we can say that, all right, there's um, a mine and this mine has, you know, a hundred workers and, you know, they have dug this land and it costs this amount of money to dig that land. So you can sort of quantify the cost of um, the production of gold. <coughs> in cryptocurrency, it's a little bit different. I think before we even look at the fundamentals, we, we sort of have to ask ourselves, like, what is actually a cryptocurrency? Um, if we look and we peel behind the layers, essentially what it is, it's a digital token that is um, created on a network with a distributed database. Now, when we say a distributed database, then we, we start to think of like, all right, like what are databases, right? Like databases are just store of information. So like Facebook is a database. Um, your accounting records in a bank is a database. Um, essentially, your chat records on Twitter is also part of a database. So then how do we actually assign value on something which is just like, you know, data that's sitting on a distributed database that you do not own? That's the real question behind like, you know, trying to understand the fundamentals. But if we try to distill all of these coins into four words or less, you, know, you, you end up coming to a point where you sort of look at a coin and say that, all right, like, that coin has those properties. And then we can start to really try and nut the value of that particular network or you know, the coin. So like in the case of Bitcoin, um, it's pretty much known as a digital gold alternative right now. Um, it's finite in supply, so it's only got 21 million coins. Uh, it's quite difficult to mine. Um, even if you had a miner, it's, it's very difficult to mine a full Bitcoin. Um, you're competing with everyone else that's also mining on the same network. And um, if you start looking at other things like Ethereum, you know, like the way I look at Ethereum, and I like to call Ethereum is like it's a, it's a digital arcade a token arcade, you know, you can put in a token and the arcade will do an instruction that you instruct it to do. So say it was um, a Pac-Man machine, right? If you put your Ethereum into that Pac-Man machine, it, it's, you can play Pac-Man. So essentially it's a uh, programmable contracts and, you know, you can program the money to do certain things. Like, you, you know, like when you put $10 into a contract, it'll send $5 to person A, $5 to person B. So once we start to look at this, then we, we say that, all right, like, you know, how do we actually start to really figure out, you know, the value behind, you know, all of this utility? Um, then what we do is we'll look at some of the key concepts that we use in, like, you know, computer science and try and extrapolate, like, where the value actually comes from. Now, there isn't actually a real tangible or solid way to calculate the value of a cryptocurrency network because it's so fluid um, and it's really dependent on who's using it for what purpose and at that point in time, was that something that um, people felt was needed in society? So um, there's this guy by the name of Matt Kalf. Um, he came up with this rule or a law, it's called the, uh, the Matt Kalf's law and the effect of a network is proportional to the number of users connected to the system. So if we look at that statement, um, what we can essentially extrapolate is that like a telephoning system with only two phones is not very valuable because there's only one connection that can be built between two phones. Now if you extend that to five phones, the number of connections increase. 
Um, so if you keep increasing the number of phones, the number of connection keeps increasing rapidly because each phone can connect to all of the phones in the network. So by that same virtue, if we look at a blockchain, a blockchain is only as strong as the amount of users that are using a blockchain. So if we look at Bitcoin, for example, you know, like um, last time I checked, Bitcoin had something around like six and a half thousand nodes, which means that at any one point in time, the network is secured by six and a half thousand computers. Now, what does that mean to us who like decide to want to dabble in this space? It means that we can more or less assess a network's survivability because what's important is like if you store data in a network or in a hard drive. You want to make sure that that data stays there because once you lose that data, you lose all the information along with it. Say, for example, if you had a hard drive or a thumb drive and you've um, kept your um, precious family photos in there, now what, what would be the value of the family photos to you as a person? You know, like it's priceless, right? Because those are memories. Um, to someone else, they're just data. And in, in the case of like Facebook, what they do right now is they actually take that data and monetize it. So you can say that, you know, like, um, that a value has been placed on it, but the value is not really a, um, a true value. It's just what it was being traded in the market um, and what the market was willing to pay for that information. Um, so we start to look in, in cryptocurrency. We can start to get a feel of like, all right, like a cryptocurrency is basically just a network. And the value of the network is dependent on the data that's sitting on the network. Then we can start to elaborate and say that, all right, like if we extrapolate all of that down, then we can you know, look at cryptocurrency and say that if we can identify the type of cryptocurrency it is, and we can identify that what it does, then we can somewhat place a fair value on it. When I say fair value, I mean it's how much you are willing to pay for that particular service. So for example, like, um, there's a coin called Golem. And um, you know, the, the way I like to describe Golem is like, uh, uh, decentralized uh, Amazon Web Services. So it's decentralized cloud computing services. How much is that worth to you as, uh, as an individual? You know, would it be useful for you to be able to switch on that resource as easy as electricity in a decentralized way? That's a question that you know, we have to ask ourselves before we can place a value on a coin. And hence, that's why the value of a cryptocurrency fluctuates, um, you know, and, and moves very, very rapidly because the opinions of people in a room change um, very quickly. And based on the opinions of the people uh, that are looking at the specific coin, you know, the, the value also can fluctuate greatly because if tomorrow I look at a coin and I say that you know, this is useless and I'll, I'll dump everything, then it, create, it creates a sell pressure. And someone else may at the same time look at the same coin and say that, oh, it's cheaper than when I was intending to buy it, so I'm gonna buy it in right now. So that creates a buy pressure. So that supply and demand is what keeps the price moving up and down. And it will never really find a stable point without any form of intervention. Um, in, in the traditional like, sort of financial world, like, you know, a central bank um, has uh, you know, what we call this economic levers. You know, they can print more money. Right? So when they print more money, it, it sort of stimulates the economy because everyone now has a, excess cash, you know, they have um, cheaper credit, you know, you could get housing loans for a lower percentage. Instead of paying 7.5%, you're now paying 4.5%. So that stimulates an entire economy of um, properties because now people are able to get cheap credit to buy property and they're able to sustain that property. Um, in the case of cryptocurrency, we don't have that sort of flexibility, right? It's, it's a network with a set of rules. So say Bitcoin, it's only 21 million coins that will be minted. And it's minted at 12 and a half bitcoins every 10 minutes right now. That will change to 6.25 in three years, and then it will change from 3.125 in another you know, seven years from now. So then you, know, you sort of like, you don't get the same flexibility that you get with you know, your traditional money because there's, there's no sort of regulator sort of like, you know, are making sure that they, the, the blows are cushioned. So it's all just supply and demand action. And then you have speculators that come in that will say that, I believe that this coin will rise by a factor of three in the next year. And then that person propagates that belief into the, the room and you know, the opinions of the coin changes and the price increases. 
whether or not the fundamentals match that opinion is not uh, what we're sort of like say it's it's a it's not a rational decision. Um, but as we know, you know, like none of us really make rational decisions when we you know like put money into a, a coin. You know, we we have a a sort of idealistic view of things and say, oh, you know, like power ledger, you know, they're decentralizing electricity and, you know, we believe that everyone should have free and fair access to electricity and they put their money in. So if we start looking at these different types of cryptocurrency, um, you know, really we distill it down to the two main types of consensus. And this is what gives the, uh, the network its stability, right? Like if we look at the price, the price fluctuates greatly every single day. But if we look at the actual like, mining protocol and you look at the, the amount of hash rates that actually goes through the network, it's actually fairly stable. So you know, if we look at it in, in that sense, like looking at the network's stability or how it functions is probably the best way of assessing its fundamental value. Because if you have electricity that's up 99.9999% of the time, that's valuable because you can run like you know mission critical um, IT systems on it you know like hospitals can function without a hitch if you get brownouts all the time then that network's not really valuable so um, proof of work um, I'm sure a lot of you have like heard about like um, how all these cryptocurrencies are essentially secured does anyone here uh, not know proof of work Um, so proof of work is somewhat similar to um, if we look at like a. In, I'm going to take another example, right? Like um, a factory, and let's say this factory generates uh, or, or makes shoes. And um, if you were a worker in a factory, you get a ticket for every shoe that you produce. And at the end of the whole day, once you finish producing the number of uh, shoes, you get a stack of tickets that you submit to the supervisor, and the supervisor will disperse the cash to you. Right? So in, in, a, in a Bitcoin blockchain, it's kind of similar like when you have a, a node, a mining node. And so a mining node is basically a node with mining capacity or basically it can prove that it's done a certain amount of work. So they get all these tickets that they accumulate. And when, when this whole mining conglomerate or a pool solves a block, you will get a portion of um, the coins allocated to all of the miners in that pool that solved that block. So let's say if you um, contributed to 10% of the amount of total tickets that was needed to solve that block, then you get 10% of the rewards. So that's a very fair way of basically calculating uh, someone's effort because it's very, very hard to um, forge that um, proof of work. You know? So let's say in, in, in the Bitcoin network today, um, you can't actually use computers to mine Bitcoins anymore. Um, about say, seven or eight years ago, um, all Bitcoins were mined um, using computers. Um, and you could mine like 50 Bitcoins in like you know, 10 minutes um, on your own. You don't even need to join a mining pool. Uh, but the value of Bitcoin back then was so low that like, you, know, you, you were really just using coins as, as, a, as a new idea. You, know? you can say, oh look, I can actually transfer this digital credits to someone else. And this digital credits that I transfer is irrevocable and irreversible. You know, there's no one that can sort of like alter or tamper that information. And that's what sort of like started and it, it, you know, it perpetuated the system where people could trust a network to behave in a fair and honest manner because the, the rules are um, posted up there and there's no sort of arbitration that will sort of like, you know, um, alter the results of, of the network um, without like sort of like um, following a strict set of rules. So the other system that's um, very popular out there today is a proof of stake system. Now how it differs from proof of work is basically like, um, rather than actually holding the coins itself um, uh, as, as, as a reward for your time or the effort that you've put into the network, um, this system runs based on the fact of how much you have contributed to the network in terms of, uh, in most cases it's financial. So like, you know, when you start a network like, and there's, a thousand nodes in there and each one of those nodes are given you know a thousand coins and that that sort of creates you know um, a network of uh, a million nodes uh, a million uh, coins with a thousand nodes so each one of these uh, guys are so then they will set a set of rules on top of that so um, in a case like you know they say that all right let's print out um, two percent of the total supply 
in a year. So that becomes the operational rules of the network. Whether or not that set of rules is going to be better than a proof of work system or uh, you know, it, it's more superior in uh, sort of like a, uh, energy savings, um, they sort of lose some properties in terms of like um, the fairness because now you can't really prove that that block it actually requires you know this certain amount of energy to produce. Um, if we look from this point, then we can start to say like a proof of work system is actually a lot easier to calculate what is its true fundamental value. So you can start to look at like Bitcoin charts and you can start to say. Um, all right, in, in the last eight years, like how much has the hash rate grown? And if you extrapolate the hash rate and you extrapolate the number of users, you can more or less come down to a point where you can gauge what is the cost of electricity of securing the network today. Because if, uh, if it requires a million computers to secure the network, and each one of these computers is worth $2,000, and the electricity that's required to power one of these machines is 1.2 kilowatts, Per hour, you can come to a somewhat of an idea what is the, the cost of securing the entire network and the cost of minting new, new tokens. Um, whether or not this will allow us to make a better decision in deciding what coins to put our money in, I don't think so. But at least it gives us an idea um, how, survive, how, how the network can survive in in a bear market like this, because if, if the network actually has a fundamental value of doing what it does best, which is that it has those um, properties that can be described in four words or less, then and you, you assess that based on those four attributes or the, the four words, then you can say that, okay, great, like, you know, is this digital money um, reliable? Is Bitcoin reliable as digital um, gold? If you think it's reliable as digital gold, um, then you will put at least a little bit of money in there as a way of basically saying that, you know, I kind of like this network and I put my money in there as a form of faith. The whole idea behind Bitcoin or cryptocurrency today is that we are supporting um, an open uh, network that's not controlled by a central authority. So for each one of us that's actually putting our sort of like uh, trust into that network, it increases the value because you become a user of that network. So I think um, that sort of encapsulates what I want to um, uh, talk about today. I can um, show you a... Question for you. Sure. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, that is a, uh, a Bitcoin question, right? Now, um, in, in, in the case of Bitcoins, um, when we look at the number of coins that are actually being minted today, it's 12 and a half Bitcoins. And if we look at the, the number of hashes, let's have a look at a, a real, real life um, sort of figures on this and we can uh, come to a bit of a question here. So if we look at this um, slide over here, we can see that the hash rate has um, steadily increased over the, um, the period. Mm. So that's a period um, for two years. So you can see over um, this eight years, the network has actually steadily increased and in the last one or two years, it's gone exponential, right? So based on the same way that we can look at the strength of the network, right now, the strength of the network is at an all-time high because the number of hash rates securing the network is a staggering amount at the moment. In terms, in terms of the price, we, we look and say that, all right, the, the network has um, grown tremendously over the last eight years. 
has the amount of information being stored in the network also increased because the number of users have gone up. So in the past, if there was only like 100,000 users and the data of 100,000 users is not as valuable as the data of you know, like 10 million users, because now 10 million users are storing money or digital gold on the network, that they feel that um, it's going to remain on the network. So they, they keep their coins. If they lose that confidence, they drop off those coins because they don't believe that the network can, can retain um, information of ownership. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so when this network was young, um, in its early years, from 2009 to 2015, the network was very vulnerable because um, if, if we, when I was mining, uh, my mining rig would only last me for six to 12 months before it was completely obsolete. So I had a, a mining machine that had 60 giga hashes and I could mine one, one and a half bitcoins a month for four months. And then it would taper down to about like 0.5 and then you know, 0.2. And in month seven, like, I just have an expensive heater in my home. You know, that's how fast the network evolved. And at that time, it was so volatile as well. Like, like today, if you look at the Bitcoin network um, in general, it's very hard to do an attack on the Bitcoin network because first, it's a proof of work network, which means that you actually have to have the number of hash rates to be able to substantiate that you have done a certain amount of hash. So it makes it very challenging for um, someone to try and forge that. Um, on the other hand, younger proof of work um, protocols today face an immense risk because like, someone can divert all that power off another um, network just to maliciously attack that smaller network. So the question is, you know, like, is that network worth attacking? And is, if it is, is it worth protecting? Are there an equal number of people that will try to protect that integrity of that network? Um, the network has to survive through that period where you know, like it's, it's like a stress test. Bitcoin has been stress tested for eight years consecutively. It's never been you know, brought down in eight years. So that in itself is like a track record. You know, like it's the, the first blockchain that survived eight and a half years. Uh, question back. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, so value is essentially a, um, a perceived um, human concept, right? Yeah. So if I had a block of gold, it's not worth anything if there's no one willing to buy that block of gold, right? So even if that block of gold was uh, valued at 100,000 like 10 years ago, if today food is the most important thing, that block of gold will pale in comparison to food, right? So we, we will never say that there's actually any sort of like fundamental value for any assets to begin with. When I guess the, the fundamental side of things is just basically saying that, all right, what, what is the, uh, the society willing to pay for that um, particular asset at that one point in time? And it's like, if we extrapolate that to a longer period, then you can see that you know, society has on average been able to pay, let's say like uh, $5 for um, a kilo of wheat. And that's based on the amount of income and how much they're willing to pay out of that, right? So those are like concepts which you know, like we start to get used to. And you know, like all of us are used to using Australian dollars in Australia. And like Australian dollars been around and that, that becomes the stable form of a, a transaction currency, right? So then we, we look and exchange items based on uh, a virtual or a numerical representation of that asset, that, that transactional currency.
I, I, I get where you're coming from in, in the sense that like, um, none of these really have any fundamentals, right? Like, you know, we're, we're in what we call the fiat economy, right? So a country is only measured by the strength of its economy. So like, is there any fundamentals to the strength of the economy when the strength of the economy can fluctuate every year? See, why, why am I so confident about Bitcoin is that like, irregardless of the price going down, the network security is going up. So like, why would I be worried? Like, if, the, if the hash rate went down by half, I would be totally worried, even if the price is going up 100 times, you know, because then it shows that the network's actually getting less secure. So you know, it's, it's sort of like um, the measure of uh, the, the value that people are willing to pay at that point in time is entirely perceived. You know, like if tomorrow there was an ETF saying that, um, you know, Bitcoin was approved um, as one of the tradable assets, you know, and, uh, you know, next thing you know, Bitcoin's going to hit like $50,000. Like, is there any fundamentals behind why Bitcoin would hit $50,000? I don't think there's any, but apart from pure speculation. But the network itself, the security of it will tell you that, like, all right, if I commit a transaction into the network at one point in time, is the network going to survive? Like, I think it will. Personally, I really like proof of work networks. I know they are not environmental friendly uh, because they consume a lot of electricity. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, um, if we had a system like this which can secure financial records at a global scale um, and you can handle a lot of transactions, that network will be worth a lot. Um, that's definitely not the case today. I mean, with a network that only settles seven to 10 transactions a second, it's not. It's not very useful, right? But despite that, like, you know, we, we can look back a few years and say that checks used to take three days to clear, right? Like, if you could settle a Bitcoin transaction in 10 minutes, it's still, like, to me, it's, like, it's still way better than giving you a physical check that you have to go to the bank to bank in. It doesn't. There's a fee, right? So when you have a check, it has a fee. So the network processing also has a fee as well. So one interesting perspective around this is that like, if we look at the, um, the net hash rates, it's gone up exponentially. One of the reasons is because like, you know, we are really testing the limits of silicon, right? When, when I started mining in 2011, it was 65 nanometer chips. Today, we're looking at like 12 nanometer chips. And the real sort of theoretical limit of silicon is around 8 nanometers. So you can't really make chips smaller than 8 nanometers. So which means that we're already reaching the tail end of um, Moore's law with silicon, unless we have like you know some quantum computers that can 
bring up this exponentially, it's, we're not going to see a real gradual improvement in terms of the, the hashing power that will come in. It will all become linear at some point because the, the amount of hash rate that's coming in is like, how long has n minus s9 been around? Three years? And they're still like, you know, generating profit today. The miner that I had lasted six months. Right, so it's, it's, it's almost telling us that like, you know, the, the network security is, is progressing at a very high speed, but it's also sort of tapering and now it's very linear. So even if you had like one machine, you're not going to really alter um, the trajectory of the network by much. Thank you so much for, for your time and your sure. presentation. Thank and you, Dr.